crumbling community housing, mystery liquid in subway tunnels, delayed subway extensions and road repairs. Ontario's capital city has some significant infrastructure problems. Joining us now to tell us what lies behind the problems and why they're happening, here's Matty Simiatiki. He's a professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto. And Matty, it's good to have you back in the studio. How are you doing? Great. It's nice to be here. I just want to start by laying out, this is only in the greater Toronto area, so Toronto, Durham, York, Halton, Peel, just those regions around here. The Burlington GO Station, the Union Station Revitalization Project, the renovation of the GO Train Transit Shed, the automatic train controls on the TTC, the Clarkson GO Parking Garage, Queens Quay Revitalization, Nathan Phillips Square, which is the square in front of Toronto City Hall Revitalization, the Spadina Subway Extension. All projects that have gone past time and over budget. Let's narrow in on some of these. Here's what Tess Kalinowski says in the Toronto Star about the Spadina subway extension. The nearly nine kilometer subway extension was originally expected to cost $1.5 billion. It then ballooned to $2.5 billion, and now it's expected to reach $2.9 billion. That's about $1.4 billion over budget. I know this is a simple question, no doubt with a complicated answer, but how does this happen? Yeah, this is a chronic problem on big infrastructure problems, projects, and we've seen it around the world. This is not just a Toronto problem, it's not just a Canada problem. This is a global problem. My colleague at Oxford University, uh, Bent Fluberg, he did a study of major transportation infrastructure projects. He found that the average cost overrun on these projects was 28%, and 9 out of 10 of them were going over budget. So this is really a global issue. Why is this happening? A few reasons. And it really depends on how cynical or how pessimistic you want to be. Um, if you're an optimist, you think, well, it's a technical problem. These projects are big, they're complicated. Um, you, you don't know what's going to happen until you open up the walls, until you go underground. There's scope changes, um, the weather can be bad. So there's these technical issues that are difficult to handle, and you would expect costs are going to go up. Um, but the problem with that explanation as being the only explanation for this is that the problem hasn't gotten better over time. You would expect that if that we would learn from past experiences, if it was only a technical problem, we would get better. Hey, you should be anticipating the unanticipated at a certain point, right? That's right. So most of us, um, if you're a homeowner, you've done a renovation, you know that these issues come up. The difference is that these are professionals. They should be. They do these jobs over and over again. You'd think they'd learn from past experience. But the record is that the projects have been um, tragically over budget consistently over a really long period, at least 70 years is what the data shows. So we have to look for other explanations, at least complementary explanations. Um, and what we, we what we see is that there's really political uh, and economic challenges with this. Politicians, they may, they may uh, promote low bids uh, or low uh, budgets to get their projects funded. They're in competition with all these other regions, all of whom are promoting their own projects, and if their, bu if their budgets look very large, they might not get the money. So do my project in my part of the community because Precisely. it'll cost less than his over there or Precisely. hers over there. Precisely. And so, and so, and once the once the uh, once the shovels are in the ground, once the budget the budget is allocated, it's very hard to turn back. How many projects can you think of that got turned back once they were started because they had budget problems? Very few. So there's a real incentive there. Also, contractors they might lowball the bids to get on the job, knowing that they can start claiming for change orders once the job uh, starts and once once they have their shovels in the ground. So there's really an incentive gap uh, all the way across how these projects are delivered, and that may be complementing this issue of the technical problems. It's probably some combination of all of these, technical, political, economic, that lead us to uh, having this really chronic problem on big infrastructure projects. Let me follow up on one thing you said in that answer, which is they've done these over and over and therefore they ought to know by now. And I spoke to somebody else earlier today who said, that's actually, we haven't built, we as a, as a community haven't built big stuff in so long that we actually haven't been doing these over and over and over again. Private sector companies have been, but the, for example, on the Union Station, the city itself hasn't done anything that big in decades. And therefore, we don't have this institutional memory on how to do these things properly. Is that a, is, I mean, is that a potential explanation? That could be part of it. We do lose momentum a little bit. Um, people will go to other jurisdictions to build big projects, but we have done a ton of building in this region. I think that that's a bit of a misconception. We've built dozens of projects, some really large ones, uh, where shovels are in the ground. We did the um, uh, Shepherd subway line. We've done now Eglinton. We have that in the ground. We have Spadina, uh, the Spadina subway extension. We have a lot of these projects that are ongoing um, where there should be learning. Um, that has been centralized to some extent within Infrastructure Ontario. We've built a lot of social infrastructure, a lot of hospitals. We've opened 40 
new hospitals and prisons. Uh, we have 35 more that are in the they're ground. They're all built by the private sector, though, weren't they're, they? They're planned by government, and this is an important point here, that it's not either or. Just because you do a public-private partnership doesn't mean that the government's role is eliminated. The government's role might be shifted, but they still have a very important planning function, and they fund a lot of these projects as well. The private sector does not replace uh, the role of uh, government in these projects. Let's talk about the Union Station upgrade, and uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up here. The upgrade involves, among other things, preserving the heritage elements of the building and building a new retail concourse. The original budget was more than $600 million. The revised budget is around $800 million. It was supposed to be completed this year. We now know, of course, it's not going to happen, and we don't know when it's going to be open. Uh, okay, Union Station was one of these things where, as you described it earlier, the weather got too cold, and we went through this wall, and we mm -hmm. found the unanticipated. But that seems like an enormous amount to miss by, doesn't it to you? You know, this, this is actually quite in line with big transportation pro, uh, projects, and especially transit projects. So I mentioned that uh, Professor Fluberg at Oxford, his study showed the average is 28%. That's over the whole portfolio of transportation infrastructure, roads, bridges, highways, tunnels, uh, and transit. When you isolate just transit, the average is closer to 45% cost overrun. Mm. So we are actually within the range. And it's, it's sad to say that, actually, that, that for someone like myself, I can look at that project and say, that was pretty predictable, actually. What's the worst one you've encountered? There have been some bad ones. The, um, uh, the Euro Tunnel, that one had a major cost overrun. Um, we've, seen, we've seen them really all across uh, uh, Europe. Uh, some of the projects in the developing world have had some major uh, cost overruns. So th this is really a, a global uh, phenomenon that, that we have to get our arms around and try to figure out how to solve because I think it really undermines, it starts to undermine people's confidence that we can actually deliver these projects. It's not like this is particularly new. I mean, the Darlington nuclear reactors were supposed to cost a couple of billion, ended up being 16 billion. Right. Uh, the Sky Dome was supposed to be 150 million, ended up being, I think, six or 700 million. Mm -hmm. So we've, been, we've seen this movie before. Are we purposely, willingly, wo like woefully and uh, just closing our eyes to the obvious here? Well, this is the political part of it, is do you, how much do you believe this is just a technical problem? And when you talk to people who are in the project management business, they'll give you all the technical explanations. The scope changed on this project. We found stuff behind the walls. The utilities were really problematic. They weren't where we expected. This is a 100-year-old street. The weather was terrible. We've had two very cold winters. But all of those things seem to be somewhat predictable. You would expect that you would learn from this. Um, even if you don't have the expertise here, a lot of the companies that are doing these jobs are global firms. They have the expertise. A lot of the people who are advising our governments are global firms that have expertise from around the world. You'd think you'd learn. There is this other political part of the explanation, this what my colleague calls strategic misrepresentation. That's the word Ben Fluberg calls. Strategic you, misrepresentation. Yes. That's great. Uh, that's a nice academic <laughs> term. Right. So I mean, so there is this issue that's, that's baked into these, these big projects. There are so many interests that get served. If you build a project in one place, there can be a lot of benefits for those folks. And by, by necessity, you may not have the money or the capacity to build them somewhere else. So there's a lot of competition, both within cities and across across the country when you're looking for federal money, when you're looking for provincial money within provinces. There's a lot of competition, and so people have a real incentive to underestimate the cost of their bids up front to get their projects funded. I'm really not trying to be a smart aleck with this question, but I noticed the other day that two senior managers at the Toronto Transit Commission, which is building this Spadina subway extension, got fired. Mm -hmm. It's the first time in memory anybody can recall anybody getting fired for a project going beyond the date and over budget. Do we need to fire more people? Would that help? I think the question is whether they were scapegoats for a much larger and systemic problem or whether it was something that they did themselves. That information hasn't been released yet, so it's hard to tell. I think we have to come up with new accountability models uh, that ensure that both companies and individuals are accountable, uh, and they have to understand what those are before the projects start. Um, that The model that they used to build that project of breaking it up into all these different components really put the, con the contract managers at a disadvantage in terms of how you enforce that contract going uh, down the road. A lot of contracts now, at least on the construction side, are being bundled so that the contract, so that the government who's managing the contract has a lot more leverage when they're working with one person, one design and builder, rather than, uh, rather than a whole bunch of different contractors that when things start to go wrong, they all start pointing at each other uh, and saying either uh, someone else made the mistake or your drawings were wrong. Um, and that's where a lot of the change orders and uh, um, delays can start to come in. Would better monitoring earlier in the process help? One of the really surprising things about these projects is how many of them start before you have a finalized plan. You, you would start building before you have a finalized plan. You start signing contracts and you start building before you have a finalized plan. Does that make plan. sense? 
No. The short answer is no. I mean, we do it for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we might want to start because that's when we have the budget. The budget comes in that year. We know that once we start the construction, it's going to be very hard to cancel our project. Um, but we often start these projects without having a full sense of what we're actually going to be building. So um, in that, that, that's a very simple, obvious thing. Don't start until you have a full uh, complement of understanding of what you're going to be building, until you have a full plan, until you have this political sign-off. How often do politicians come in after the plan has been set and say, oh, I want another station? That's a huge cost. And once, once you have a contract with someone, to change that contract is very costly. That um, was the story on the Sky Dome. You know, we want a baseball stadium with a roof. Oh, wait, we want a hotel. Oh, wait, we want a fitness center. Oh, wait, we want, you know, and pretty yeah. soon it's five times as expensive. And so that's one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at all of those numbers, um, is to keep in mind that sometimes the scope changes dramatically. So the contract managers will say, it wasn't actually our fault. We were on budget in terms of what we said we were going to do, but the scope changed dramatically. Not on all of these projects. Many of these projects just had straight contract management problems. But we do see in some of these cases, for all sorts of reasons, the scope starts to creep. We call it scope creep. And it creeps and it creeps, and sometimes it even gallops. And you see these massive changes in, uh, in, 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 the, in the project. If you look from the beginning to the middle to the end, it, you're actually building something very different. And that's when the costs uh, can escalate too. I mean, anyone who's done a home renovation has this experience. Once the walls open, maybe we should put in a new bathroom or maybe we should put in a fireplace. Uh, once we've started this, let's, let's get our dream home. But the challenge is, when you have a contract with someone, that can be very problematic uh, in terms of how you then uh, lock in that cost. You've lost a lot of leverage as a project manager once that's signed, especially if you don't know exactly what you're building uh, before you start. Okay, so more solutions here. Um, I understand. Don't start building until you've actually signed mm -hmm. off on a final design. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What else? So I think there's two real places where we can focus. One is on the technical side. Definitely don't start building until you know what you're doing. Also, we need to be using information and uh, past experience a lot more systematically. Uh, data analytics, if you will, to understand how these projects are working, where the specific risks and the specific problems are coming up in our different types of projects. So it's interesting, when you think about sports, sports has essentially become an analytics business. They collect a ton of data, they now have uh, they now have these science departments, these analytics departments who are measuring what's going on in the projects. We need to be doing that with infrastructure. We need to make this much more systematic. And then the second part of this is using that knowledge to then create incentives that incentivize the contractors um, and the government to deliver on what they say they're going to do. So public-private partnerships are one model that tries to incentivize to use private finance, uh, in this case especially during construction, so that the contractor has what's known as skin in the game. They have their own incentive. They're not, it's performance-based. They're not going to get paid the full amount from government until this project project is done until it's done properly, reaches substantial completion and gets signed off on. So they have a lot more incentive to finish rather than to start making claims because they, they're out to their lenders. Their lenders are going to want their money back with interest. And the longer that goes, the higher the interest payments are. So that's one uh, model. And then we need to use uh, information to track how people are performing and use that to assign future projects. It seems surprising that when you apply for your next contract after you made a mistake on your past one, or your past number of projects, there's not necessarily a mechanism to say, we systematically understand that you haven't performed very well. We're going to hold that against you to some extent when you build your next project. We need to be much more systematic, but you can only do that if you have data that allows you to understand how different firms are performing, how different projects are performing, and then use that information to make better decisions in the future. Having studied it all, are you of the view now that these projects are simply too big, too complex, and too politically charged ever to come in on time and on budget again? No. The short answer is no. I'm you really think we can turn the corner on this? I'm an optimist. And in some ways, it depends what you mean by on time and on budget. Uh, Infrastructure Ontario, they've built projects that are hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they report that their projects are actually quite good at coming in on time and on budget. The question is, what budget are you talking about? Um, how, how much uh, risk premiums are included? How much of an insurance policy, basically, have they bought to make sure that that project comes in on time and on budget? But I think we can learn from past experience. I think we can try to create incentive structures that remove some of the politics from these projects. And I think we have to become much more aware as uh, constituencies and as voters that when we see these projects going over budget, we need to be, we need to hold people accountable for that at the ballot box. So what does that mean? What I think that means is when you see projects that are being allocated or uh, assigned on political grounds, when you see projects where um, they're being done, uh, where there's not the systematic planning, where anyone with a magic marker is now a transportation planner or an infrastructure planner, I think we have to, as voters, look at that and say, this is going to be a recipe for disaster. When someone t comes to the microphone and tells you the project is going to cost something that's way lower than any project in the past for that similar type of infrastructure has cost, take that with a grain of salt because that is probably not going to happen. And that's a recipe for these projects 
escalating very slowly and then possibly getting much more expensive further down the road as we start to learn more. Because it's happened in the past and it'll most likely happen in the future. So how do we get private companies to bid more honestly and give a more, you know, a more truthful bottom line number? Well, part of that then is incentivizing them and ensuring that, uh, that they have what I, what I would call skin in the game. So this is on the construction side. Um, certainly we can use past experience to much more systematically measure how much of past projects actually cost. Not what they bid, but what it actually come in at. So you can see, uh, so you can see what those past projects, so you can see how you can use that information to then inform what they would be bidding. Well, let's take the subway for example. We haven't built new subways in Toronto in 20 years. Yeah. So whatever information you had about building the Shepherd subway 20 years ago, is that really going to be helpful if you drill, if you want to build an extension of the uh, Spadina subway today? There have been dozens or hundreds of projects built around the world. And uh, Ben Fluberg's argument is that we need to be using this outside view to bring in external knowledge, not just our own. That's when we uh, have these optimism biases, when we only look at our own experiences. We can sometimes be blinded to what the full complements of risks are. We should be learning from projects, not just in, on, in Ontario, but actually globally, of how they did it, both in terms of where their failures were and where their successes are. Well, let me ask you about that, because you keep an eye on the UK, right? Sure. OK, London has, I mean, they've built tons of new subway lines and, and uh, you know, both over, over the ground and underground rail uh, over the last several years. I mean, you go to London, it's unbelievable how much infrastructure they're building there right now. How much of that is coming in on time and on budget, do you know? Um, I don't have the specific details on those projects. They're doing this project called Crossrail, which is the biggest uh, infrastructure project in Europe at the moment. And by all accounts, it's going uh, pretty well. Uh, it's used sort of a blended public-private partnership model. So it's, it's, it, it's not, when the projects get too big, a single firm can't take all of that risk on themselves because if, if, if the project fails, they're going to go bankrupt. They won't have the capacity to actually manage that risk. So they've tried to break it up and use all sorts of creative uh, mechanisms. But I would just say, when people from London come to Toronto, they also say, look at all the building we're doing. Look at, mm. look at all of the projects, Spadina Subway, Eglinton Crosstown, Union Station, um, the waterfront. We have a ton of infrastructure projects going on here too, some of which uh, go well, um, but some, most of which, uh, as, you, as your document showed, are really not doing as well as they could, and I think we have to get better at that. Do, should we be looking at all of this? I know politicians use this expression, but uh, this just in, they're not always accurate or truthful in the way they describe something. These projects, uh, investments or really sort of negative costs at the end of the day? I think that's really the key. We have to shift the view of, on infrastructure from a spending line to an investment line. Infrastructure delivers major social benefits. It delivers economics and productivity and job creation benefits. Even if it costs 10 times as much as it's supposed to? Well, this is going to be my next point. You have to pick the right projects and you have to deliver them effectively. We shouldn't um, tar all infrastructure with the same brush. Some projects have had major social benefits. Think of our subway. Think about what our city would be like if we hadn't built the subway. Um, so there are huge benefits to these infrastructure projects. But the first thing is we have to pick the right ones. We have to engage with communities early. We have to pick the right projects because people become cynical when you see projects getting built that are in the wrong place or are, too, are over, overbuilt, um, like the Shepherd Subway, which has very low ridership, which really never should have been built if you did a quantitative analysis. It shouldn't have been built with that technology. Uh, and we're starting to see, our, see these trends repeating themselves um, as different interest groups try to become engaged in decision making. So we really, we can see infrastructure as a social benefit, uh, as an economic driver, as a, as, as a way of uh, uh, improving the environment, but we have to pick the right projects projects or else we run into trouble. One last follow up on that then. Okay, I take your point. Investing in infrastructure is key to the future vitality and prosperity of the province. In the city of Toronto, right now, uh, there is um, a considerable amount of political heft behind building uh, the Scarborough subway. Uh, every independent study I've seen suggests there is neither the um, ridership, future ridership, or potential development to go around mm -hmm. where a potential um, Scarborough subway line would go to make it worth doing? Should they do it? Short answer, no. I'm on record on this project. I've written in the Toronto Star an op-ed piece about the Scarborough subway. I'm concerned that, that the plan for a subway, not transit investment in Scarborough, but the plan for that subway is is the wrong technology. It's overbuilt, it has too high capacity, it won't have enough stops. It's too expensive technology for that location and that amount of density around the stops. The thing with transit especially is you have to pick the right technology for the right land use and the right location. They have different costs, they have different benefits, and you have to really be systematic about that. Deciding that everyone deserves uh, subways 
is really a short-sighted way of planning transit and you're going to end up with these very high costs down the road. Transit is not just the cost of constructing it but also the cost, cost of operating and maintaining it. We've spent tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars just since the Shepherd Line has opened, not to mention the billion dollars we spent to build it. These are massive costs that could go elsewhere and really start to make people cynical about whether government can actually uh, deliver on the promises that infrastructure can provide. So the Shepherd Subway, excuse me, the uh, Scarborough Subway today, 1.56 billion I think is the price tag. If they ever do build it, what do you think it'll eventually cost? I would start with the 28% cost inflator, <laughs> and I would probably go up as high as 45%, just as the just just right off the top of my head, using the averages that my colleague uh, Ben Fluberg study has showed. I mean, this is what I mean by being systematic about it, and I think the public can be more aware too. We probably want and wish and hope that these projects are all going to come in at the numbers that are promised. We all have this what, what's called optimism bias. We all want, think that we can do something that maybe someone else hasn't done. We have more control over the situation. We're maybe a little better than everyone else uh, who's tried this in the past. But the reality is, look at the other experiences experiences that have happened. When you see the numbers of, of the overruns that have happened on your other projects, there's no reason to expect that it's not going to be the exact same on the projects going forward unless we come up with more strategic ways of delivering them. Gotcha. Matty Simiotiki from the U of T School of Geography and Program and Planning. Good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.